Well, good morning from Oregon, I'm assuming. Uh, just, just north of Oregon. I'm, in, uh, I'm just close to Vancouver, Washington. Oh, yes, I know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> well, so welcome, we're... William Paul Young, <laughs> author, nice of, yeah, author of The Shack and uh, multiple other books I see. Um, eight. Have you authored eight books or more? Uh, let's see. Um, the Shack, Crossroads, Eve, Lies We Believe About God, and then two reflections. So six. Nice. Very yeah. nice. Plus, there's a study, right? There's a uh, study for the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So seven, I guess. Yeah. So <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about me and where I'd like to um, just draw from your knowledge. Um, so Unlocking Secrets for Women is a brand that's been here since 2004. And my goal was to provide education, information, quality products and resources for the benefit of women and their families. Because I just know that women to the most part lead the family and a lot of times they're great influencers and if we can get them nice and strong and and uh, uh, supported they can then be great influencers over their children their husbands <laughs> their family I have um, a great respect for women so what I'd like to do is I mean there's so many pieces of the shack that are um, relevant to to all people but I'd like to throughout our chat this morning if it's okay with you, I know you've opened the door to personal conversations through your videos. It's kind of, there's everything's kind of open, yep, yep. <laughs> but I also, but I also understand that you are married to a wonderful woman and I want to be respectful of her and the questions that I would ask you. So I would just ask you to guide me. Um, um, not a problem, but pretty much okay. everything, everything's on the table. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, let's just take care of business. So uh, in the background, I would like to tell you how I was given a copy of The Shack. Okay. So I was producing, um, I was actually invited to produce a TV series here in Vancouver. And I was interviewing the former um, captain of the Canucks, Ryan Walter. Really? Who, yeah. And Ryan, at the end of the interview, handed me the book and said, you need to read this. And I said, okay. So I think it was 2000 and just like 2007. I believe uh, when he gave me the book, would that be correct in your yep, time frame? It would, would be either 2007 or 2008. Yes, it was in that time period because those are the yep, two yep. years we were producing under that particular company. And I was, he said, Kenneth, you have to read this book. Like you have to. I'm like, okay, Ryan. And when he says something like that to me, I thought, okay. And I just fell in love with the book. I fell in love with the book. I gave it to my ex-husband. I gave it to my children. I gave it to everybody that I could find for Christmas presents. Like, like you got to read this. And I want to tell you why I loved it. And then I'd like to invite you to talk to me um, in response to I'm telling you why I loved it. I loved sure. it because when I was a new believer, so I, I don't want to give my whole story, but I gave my life to God on his invitation, his drawing, his spirit, because I was kind of like a little Damascus road, not in opposition to God, but afraid that I wouldn't be loved by anyone. So sure. at 20, 23 years old, I invited this incredible amount of love into my life. I had no idea what this was, but I was filled with love and just, I didn't, he hadn't even read the Bible, but these words would come in. And then when I finally got a Bible, I looked like, oh, oh my goodness, that's what was, that's what I heard inside me. Yeah. So the whole verification of the authenticity of a real relationship with God that was not based in religious formality. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you know, all there was was traditional churches and traditional thinking. And so I fell into that against my better judgment. So I was always in conflict. The shock to me was my liberation and confirmation that, mm. yes, what I had experienced was real. And, yeah, I was in great opposition to the religion that I was now surrounded by. And I was always in trouble, always in trouble, always in trouble. I was in trouble in the pastor's office on a regular basis. I was in trouble with my husband. I was in trouble with anybody that saw leadership. <laughs> but I'd walk out of the church and I'd go, oh, there you are, Jesus. And I'd walk back and go, where'd you go? <laughs> so, <laughs> so as part of my reach as a woman, I reach out to all faiths or non-faith people. Sure. I don't flaunt my faith, but those that know me know that I do have a deep faith and they do come to me um, for prayer or help when they need it um, or challenge me if they're my atheist friend. And um, 
And so what I want to do is I want to create a platform because I believe that everybody wants to be loved. And there is no one who will ever look yep. at me and say, I do not want to be loved. Do not offer me love. I'm not interested in love unless they're so shattered and broken. They don't know how to receive it. Or they don't know how to take the risk. That's right. So what yep. I would what I would like to do is just have that approach with you, Paul, on reaching my broad based audience for people that say, I don't want anything to do with God. I, I hate him. I, and I'm like, I, I was teasing. I go, God, who? <laughs> exactly. Which is the yeah. right right response. Yeah. So I have I have friends all over the world. Some of them are believers. Some of them are not. Some of them are staunch atheists. And they know that no matter what, they can count on me for love because they keep saying that. Well, Candace, we don't believe what you believe, but we sure know you love. So I find that humorous like you do because we know who love is. So can you just tell me from your point of view what the world you believe is looking for? Because I think we all are looking for love, but what they're looking for and how the story of the shack can help them experience that opportunity. Sure. So uh, the Dutch decided to do a television show called S Searching for God, and they invited 25 celebrities who they would send out a questionnaire to these all these celebrities, and they said, one, are you searching for God? Two, um, would you be interested in being part of a reality television show funded by uh, the national board, uh, the Dutch uh, cinematic board and um, and out of the 25 questionnaires they got 22 that said yes we are searching for God and we would like to be involved so what they did is they matched um, these celebrities with someone uh, they did a lot of research and work and someone that had had an impact in that person's life that was a person of faith and and let's make that distinction right off the bat spirituality and faith are very different than religion. And, um, and I think that's part of where the conflict comes in because God's never been religious. So yeah, you know, he doesn't like it. That's what I've told no. my friends. God doesn't like, they say, I hate religion. I go, Oh, God does too. So yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so religion requires three things, separation, magic, and sacrifice. And, um, and this is about relationship. And, and relationship doesn't ask for any of those things. It, it's not about separation. It's about intimacy. It's not about magic. It's about actual authenticity. And it's not about sacrifice. It's about restorative love. And uh, so um, when the Dutch did this, they contacted me and they said, the world heavyweight uh, judo, not judo, it was judo or karate or martial arts or something, champion of the world, we would like him, we'd like to fly him to Portland, Oregon and spend a day with you because he had read The Shack and it had, it had a huge impact on him, although he was very agnostic. Mm. And um, so, and I'm like five foot six and a wish, you know, I'm just like a little guy. And, and uh, but they didn't tell him where they were sending him or to whom he was going to spend the day. That's part of the, the deal. They would on camera just put you on a plane, take them somewhere in the world to spend a day with someone. And um, so they flew him out here to Portland and we spent the day together. I mean, first thing we did is we went uh, uh, kayaking on the Willamette River and I, I stepped into my kayak and flipped it. So it, <laughs> made, it, it made for good television. <laughs> By the end of the day, we'd had all these on-camera and off-camera conversations about his journey and his story, and he was able to ask me any of the questions that he had. And at the end of the day, we, we were around a campfire, and he says to me, I want to believe, but I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hear anything, I don't, you know. And... Um, I said, well, I'm of the opinion that every human being is already a believer. They believe in something, you know, and um, so what do you believe in? And he thinks about it for a second. He says, uh, I'll tell you what I believe in. I believe in the love I have for my children. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, so talk to me about that kind of love. And um, so he does, you know, and he uses the language 
I would die for them. I would step in front of a bullet for them. I would, you know, if they're hurt, I want them well. I, I, I would suffer on their behalf, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, so, so you believe in other-centered, self-giving love? doesn't know is that that's the definition for the Greek word agape, uh, which is other-centered self-giving love. And the scripture says God is agape, other-centered self-giving love. And so he is recognizing the presence of that love within his own heart. And, and we would say, well, the, the origin and source of that would be the, the character and nature of God. And um, so I said to him, well, you believe in this love. I mean, you actually already believe in this love. So pray to love. Just pray to love. Mm. And nice. see where that goes. Yeah. And, and that was enough for him. That was like, okay, I'm not trying to pull him from somewhere he isn't. Right. To get to somewhere he should be. I'm, I'm trying to reveal to him what is already within him mm -hmm. and, and let him build and grow from there. Because... I, you know, not my job to convince anybody like, you know, that. So the shack, what the shack did is it hit people in the heart before they got a chance to engage with their heads. Yes. And it didn't matter what religious background they were from or not from, you know, and I've got plenty of friends who also are atheists or um, Muslim or Mormon or fundamentalist Christian, my mm -hmm. people, you know, and um my people have the hardest time with it because they're so stuck yes. in their heads, you know, and uh, they're, oh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're addicted to certainty already. So, yes. um, and, um, and, and it, the book is so human. And I think that's the big piece that it's so human that it's slipped past everybody's watchful dragons, at least initially. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then their heads engaged and they went, you know, God can't be that good. Or how can God be a large black African American woman or, you know, and they got stuck with head stuff. Yeah. And, um, but the, the beautiful thing about getting hit in the heart is that you, you can try to ignore it, but you can't deny it. And so at some level of your personhood, there is something there that matters. And I haven't met a person on the planet yet where absolutely nothing matters. You know, That's right. and um, something matters, something they have a longing. And I think if people can get a chance to listen to their deepest longings, they'll find uh, that it's a direct shot and path to faith and mm -hmm. to um, spirituality. So the, the shack just was a big surprise, you know, and you, you know my story well enough to know that I had no intention of even being a published author. So so the book the what it's done on the planet in terms of opening up a conversation about the character and nature of God and therefore the character and nature of what it means to be human has created a landscape for a conversation that is incredibly far reaching. And I'm I'm just like a third party saying, this is so cool. You know, I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. You know, and um but everybody it's the centerpiece is love. Mm -hmm. I mean you cannot get away from it. Mm -hmm. And and but if you look in the deepest parts of your own being, you want to be also honest. You want to be authentic. You want to be kind. You want to be good. You know, you want to you want to be a truth teller. Mm -hmm. And it's just all these layers of garbage. You know, the lies we were told growing up by our experience, the lies we were told by broken parents, the lies we were told by bullying and the culture uh, denial, the the, uh, the performance orientation of a world that says your values based on what you can do, um, the lies of the church and theology and the inability of religion to meet the deepest needs. All of these things have packed up on top of our understanding of what it means to be human. And we got buried under that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the work of God in our lives is to kindly unmask all all the dragons, you know, and uh, so that we have an opportunity to see that the true, the truth about who we are. And, and one of the lines that I love is wholeness, wholeness, personal wholeness is when the truth, uh, when the way of our being matches the truth of our being. Mm -hmm. So what's the truth of our being? And that's a fundamentally spiritual question. Yeah. It's not just a mechanistic, materialistic question. You know, why is there a longing for authenticity 
and wholeness and goodness and kindness and purity of heart, you know, mm-hmm. where, where does that originate? Yeah. And it's true. And there's such a, in, in addressing what you're saying, I find with my non-faith friends, there's a very strong sense of morality about what is right and what is wrong. And I'm trying to ask them, where do you think that originates from? Yeah, yeah. A sense of you wanting right for yourself, right for others. But where is the where where is that uh, genesis and and the the need for love as well yeah can you yeah. address uh, so i have a lot of wonderful wonderful women that i love and adore and work with and they have various degrees of understanding of spirituality and they there's some of them that really operate from the new age place the i sure, am sure. god I am God, we are all gods, and I want to be able to, um, well, hopefully I treat them all with the same love and respect and with a humble heart, knowing that I myself am just as needy as they are um, for love and compassion. Um, So how would you address that authentic desire within them to want to know? Well, for one thing, scripture calls us gods. And um, there is this, there is this high view of humanity from, you know, God doesn't become anything that is not very good and God becomes fully human. And it's not that we are gods in the sense that we are the creator who originated everything. But I think part of what the new age is trying to get at is that religion generally, I call it post piece of shit theology, right? (laughs) (laughs) That that's the truth of our I just gave her the book. She she is going to love what you just said because I'm always saying to her, you know, you're going to have a professional presence. That's hilarious. She's going to love what you just said. <laughs> anyway. Well, well <laughs> so the reaction against the religion that has told us that all we are is just a piece of garbage, that reaction is to say, n- no, we have seen something about being human that is so profoundly beautiful, so magnificent, that in, com- in contrast to the religious heritage that has told us that we are worthless and never enough, in comparison, we are gods. And scripture aligns with that. It says if you understood the character and nature of who you are, it's, it's not like you're in competition with a God who's the creator. You're, you're, you're not the creator. But even the participation to be creators ourselves on a, on a scale that is not cosmic in the sense that we didn't create the entire cosmos, but we have the power to to bring into being a human being who will never cease to exist. I mean, like, uh, how would you define that in terms of the scale of of magnificence? I mean, that's profound. And um, so uh, on the one hand, I'm going like, yeah, I get the language. I totally get the language. And Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with the language. with the caveat that we are always contingent beings. That is, we're not, in, we're not a non-contingent being. We li- we're dependent on lots of things, and then including the fact that we exist, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, that comes from the God who has created this high order of being called human, right? right? And uh, so, so in scripture, you have... Uh, lots of references to this. You have, you know, Paul says, the apostle, he says, um, don't judge anybody according to the flesh, the flesh being the false self, you know, because there is something, there is a a diamond beneath that's buried underneath this that is the truth of their being, mm-hmm. right? And there's this, there's this funny thing in, um, in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, where um, every time John sees Jesus, who we believe is the full incarnation of the character and nature of God, who is fully God, as well as fully human. Mm-hmm. So, so every time he sees Jesus, he, he falls down. I mean, he's so overwhelmed by the beauty of Jesus that he's down. And at one point, he sees Jesus, he goes down, and it's not Jesus. <laughs> and, and, and it's a human being who says, John, it's me. It's, I'm, I'm a fellow servant. Get up. Mm. Like, like, well, Jesus is always saying, get up, too. Like, hey, right. John, it's me. It's Jesus. Yeah. I'm, I'm your bud, you know. And, um, and but again, there was, there was the unveiling of 
of sight so that he saw what a human being actually is. And right. is so overwhelmed, he mistook that human being for God. Mm. Right? Yes. So, so again, um, I totally get the, con the contention here and the desire to see the good in humanity in such a way to offset the low view of humanity that has been presented by religion. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm going like, go for it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue is then, does that drive us toward independence or toward relationship? Mm. Right? There's the question. Yes. Because we're not the Trinity, right? right? The, our, our family of origin is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our, our, um, so we are contingent by very nature, but so is God. Mm -hmm. This is the beauty of the Trinity. That, that God has always been a relational being, always. Mm -hmm. and, and it took the, the early church uh, about 500 years to come up with the word perichoresis, which is a word trying to describe the relationship of God. And it means the mutual interpenetration of one with the other without the loss of personhood. Beautiful. Right? And, and one of the- The ideal marriage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the ideal relationship with anybody, yes. right? Where where there is, I see you, you see me, right? And um, and you don't lose your personhood. That's and, right. And in, in fact, our union together, even as friends, makes both of us more than we were alone. Right. Right. Yes. And uh, yeah. So so. Um, but the the movement of wholeness has got to drive us toward relationship, not toward isolation. Right. Right. And also, if what we're learning is not increasing our capacity to love, we're playing some kind of mind game here. Mm -hmm. Because and and you and I think absolutely agree that the essential nature of God is love, and therefore is our essential nature. And you can't have love without another. Right. And that's again part of the beauty of the Trinity. If God has ever been alone. That God does not by nature love. Right. Yeah. And it's so, right. you know, so, so um, in terms of your question, I, th I think it's a huge bridge point. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think we need to applaud. It, it's kind of like the Alcoholics Anonymous community teaching the church how to have small groups. Right. Right. One of the right. beauties of, of the New Age community is they're opening up the eyes of uh, downcast looking religious people yes about the humanity and and the elegance of of the human creation and i'm like go for it i'm all for that because we have we've had such a low view of humanity and i think partly the the shack the reason that it had the impact is because it has a very high view of humanity mm -hmm. and uh, much more than most of us who grew up in the religious framework of modern evangelical fundamentalism Right. Um, you know, piece of shit theology. So, <laughs> yeah. And you know what I love about the shack is you, I love what you said about the humanity. Um, and so I tried to put myself in your mind, having now listened to your story and listening to a lot of your material, understanding where you were coming from. And by the way, we all have had uh, been impacted by the hurt in others that have been unhealed. And I certainly yep. have my story. You have your story. We all have it. Everybody has it. It's, But the what I love about it is um, when I was, a, and again, I don't want to talk about me because people really want to hear you. But when I was in South Africa, forced missionary wife. <laughs> long story. <laughs> Mich I went missionary kid. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, I went as an adult kicking and screaming. Let me tell you, I did not want to go. And um, but I wanted to honor my husband at the time who had been raised in Africa in a boarding school and uh, really wanted to go back. Yeah. And so I reluctantly went back. And that's where I had my shack times where actually it almost became my cave times because I right. had to realize and and have these conversations with God that were very, very deep. Like one of them was. I hate Pharisees. I hate them. And then God whispering in my heart, I love them. What do you mean? I know. What do you mean you love the Pharisees? How can you love? Well, and then, and, well, and, and, and I love you, don't I? I mean, yes. it's like, I hate the Pharisees. Well, yeah. I love them. What do you mean you love them? Well, I love you, don't I? Yes, exactly. 
<laughs> or, 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 you know what, God, I'd be a much better pa young pastor's wife because we were ordained and sent over there and I would, did never want to be a pastor's wife. I'm not good at it. Can't even play the piano. But anyway, I said, I, I said to God, I've been a street kid since I was 12 years old. What do I know about anything. I can't, I can't even talk to people properly. And I don't like too many women in one room together. And I, I just had all these issues. And I said, you know, if you'd place me, if you give me better parents, you know what, I would have been incredible, but I didn't get them. And then God whispered in my heart, and this is the cave. This is the shock moments when he said in my heart, do you not like the parents I chose for you? I was really wounded by that because, you know, my mom, bless her heart, both my parents have passed on, but without getting into the details, my father was a, a violent, violent, violent man. Yep. I was knocked down by his car. I have a permanent hearing loss from being punched in the head as a little kid so many times. And then my mother, you know, was trying to survive in this environment of abuse. And so she was cold and long story short. And I just like, I said to him, I said, you know what, God, I'm going to give you like five minutes to straighten that answer out right now because I'm really choked with you. You're going to say that to me. I'm so hurt. You better explain yourself. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I was real. Yeah. And he said, where are you strong? And I said, oh, my God, I'm so compassionate. I could never judge anybody. And, you know, I've had an abortion. I was pregnant as a young girl. I've, I've done everything known to man wrong. I couldn't judge anybody. And then I thought about my mom and I thought about all of that. And he said, you're, and this is not something I could make up because I couldn't articulate, like you say, um, you know, this book comes out of the drive of the spirit of God, um, compelling you to share your pain it, it, through a story. God spoke these words to me and I knew they were him. Your parents' weaknesses have become your greatest strengths. I never wanted them to hurt you. Right. I never wanted them to hurt you. Right. I had never left you. I've always been there with you. Right. Right. So, so when I see the shack or I see the moments in the cave where the challenge of wisdom is to say, well, then pick a kid. You're going to judge. Yeah. yeah. This is what God taught me in those moments in my cave and in my shack in South Africa where I had to I had to face stuff in me because I couldn't move forward. That's why I love the book because many years later we were in South Africa 83 to 85 during apartheid by the way when the experience that was. And then when you wrote the book it was like finally I found another soul. Mm -hmm who understood what God had introduced me to yeah. that God sidelined by religion. And I don't blame anybody. I had a propensity to lean in that direction. Otherwise it wouldn't have appealed yeah. to me at some point. So I can't yeah. blame anybody. Yep. It was. And, and this is partly, this is why I refer to modern fundamentalist evangelicals as my people, because they are, and I don't want to, I, I don't, want to create a new division or I don't want to move to a place where now I look back and go like they're idiots or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and that wouldn't be love. Well, it, it can't be. And yet, and that's the scene, the scene in the cave. That's the judgment scene. It's my favorite I, place. Favorite. I have a, I have a friend uh, who's been on death row in Tennessee for 35 years now mm -hmm. and just saw him a couple days ago. And, um, uh, his name's Terry King. And, um, He's just waiting for the date for his death, his appeal process, oh and my all gosh. that kind of stuff. So, can't even imagine. Oh, oh, can't even imagine. Yep. And so he was 18 years old, and he shot a young man, and um, and he's now been waiting all these years to be executed. Well, he's he's one of the freest people that I know, and um, because I mean, and we talked about it. You know, his prison's obvious, and it's it's very clarifying. You can see, you can touch the walls and the bars and everything. But he told me that what changed his life was the cave scene. Mm. He said, he said, so I'm reading and Sophia is challenging Mackenzie in the cave. And he said, for the first time in my entire life, I realized that I wasn't owning my own stuff because I sat in the seat of judgment. He mm -hmm. said, he said, here I've been all these years on death row thinking I'm better than the pedophiles on death row because at least I didn't do that. Yes. And because he had a sense of self-righteous superiority, he was able to sit in a seat and not deal with his own stuff. Wow. And it was the seat of judgment that kept him from that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I think that's, again, 
the 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 book surprised us all, very much me in terms of the impact of it and how universal these kinds of things are. Mm -hmm. We sit in the seat of judgment. And um, I love your story. I I would put a little caveat in one place in it. Sure. And and because you came around the other side of it. Um, We have a, a sense of fatalism when it comes to God being in control. Mm. And, and God's not in control in terms of any sense of absolute control, because as soon as God creates Adam, God loses that control. Free will, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And yep. We've, we have got to maintain the integrity of free will. Yes. Uh, as, as that which fundamentally makes a human being human. And so, yes, God knows your parents, the truth of their being, even when they did not. Right. And, and they made a choice to have a child, whether they intended to or didn't intend to, whether they did wanted that child or not. This is the same for someone who commits rape and a child is conceived, right? It, it's not like, well, God chose for the rapist to rape someone in order yeah. for a child. The ends don't justify the means. That's right. And okay. I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And this is where I have some friction with um, some of the New Age perspective because, uh, you know— when they start talking about being gods, which I'm, I, I get, but it's almost like then there is no evil. There is nothing that is yes. actually wrong. Yes. And I'm going like, oh, no, no. There's lots of things that are wrong. They just yes. originate with us. That's how powerful we are. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, yes, because my family upbringing wasn't great, and, yes. as you know. And, um, and uh, it's, it's more like Jesus saying they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and they don't. Mm-hmm. You know, they're functioning out of their own damage and their own history, which is right back to the cave scene. Right. And in the movie, they did a really good job at this. I of, loved it. Oh. So where Mackenzie starts defending this child that he sees pictured on the wall, right, who is, who is hiding from his own father who's beaten the hell out of him. Right. And and Mackenzie starts to protect that child, and it turns out that that child is his father, who mm-hmm. then who then out of that damage beat him. Right. And so um, uh, again, we're we're dealing with the brokenness of humanity. Yes. And, and yes, God knowing the choices that would be made then works good out of it, but is not ever the author of evil, or else That's we're right. stuck. We're stuck in a religious conundrum at that point, and we have nowhere to go. So yeah. that will put us in isolation, if anything will. I love that. And thank you for that clarification. That's exactly what I think and exactly how I, I feel. And I knew you did. I, I knew you did. It was just language. Yes. And I and I think it's great that you clarified that because people are listening and those are going to trigger things inside of people. And I do not want to to be an author of, of something that would create uh, a stumbling block for someone. Yeah. I know and, you don't. Yeah. And, you know, one of the most beautiful things that God taught me was about David. So I'm absolutely consumed with First and Second Samuel on my bench every day in Africa. I cannot put it down. I'm fascinated. I'm learning about structure. I'm learning about protection. I'm learning about authority. I mean, God is just pouring, pouring, pouring into me. And I said to him, you say he was a man after your own heart. Why did you love him? Why did you love him? Why did you love him when he was doing what he was doing? Because in my, you know, um, innocence and my youngness of faith and understanding, I just saw him. Well, he committed adultery and, you know, I would expect to judge myself as sternly as what he should be judged. And, and yet... I, it's like in a combination, in a, and I'm not going to say I'm 100% uh, uh, correct in my theology, but this was my impression. Um, I saw David, you know, finally being confronted by Nathan and, you know, realizing here's a king who has the power to declare life and death. That man shall surely die. That man shall surely live. Nathan set him up to confess. And David says, that man shall surely die. And I'm like, oh, oh, he just pronounced death on himself. And since he's the highest authority in the land outside the prophets, but he is, how's he going to deal with that? And then God shows me 
in this little story in my mind, how David goes running into the Holy of Holies and grabs the horns of the altar, which if you have sin, an act of sin, and you die, that's the place of death. And this is this impression that I was given. And then quickly, the scripture in Jeremiah, um, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom or the rich man glory in his riches or, you know, let him that glory or boast boast in that he knows and understands me. And then God put this pause in my thought because this was happening over like a 15 minute period in my brain that I am the God of loving kindness and compassion. And God just said to me, David knew my secret that I am merciful, that I am compassionate. And that I realized then that if I can't be that woman and caught in adultery, now, fortunately for me, I've never done that, but I've done everything else. So I, that just levels the playing field. But I have imagined myself being that woman caught in adultery that Jesus had, uh, that they brought to Jesus. And I tell my women friends, if I could not look Jesus in the eye with sperm still running down my leg because I got hauled out of bed, if I can't look at him like that and see that he accepts me and that he knows that I know that he knows that I know and we know, if I can't have that raw kind of belief, yeah. then I think that everything is a waste of time because if I can't be that real and yep. David was that real yep. in that moment. Yeah. And so I want to ask you, what does the cave mean to you? You're the storyteller. It's coming out of your heart. What is the cave for you? If you have something to share about that, what what is that for you personally? Yeah. So it is, um, for me personally, the cave cave represents sitting in the seat of judgment, being self-righteous, thinking that you're better than anybody else. We can and always find someone less than us. <laughs> well, yeah, and and therefore that you can then justify your self righteous sense of superiority and your and and you know we do it nicely or we do it with language that's been baptized or whatever, mm-hmm. but but we still create an us and them and in terms of yeah. a scale of value, um, and that scene I'm trying to rip away the the self justification for for judgment, you know, how we act and um, how we relate to other human beings. And it's, and it's all based in our own damage. You know, it's a, it's a reflection of our own damage. Self-righteousness is, is a false sense of who you are. Oh, it's weakness. Or, yeah. It's or weakness. it's, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's an elevation of the false self. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that, that scene, I'm, I'm already in my life, but when I'm writing that, I've already gone through, you know, Mackenzie's weekend represents 11 years for me. Mm-hmm. I've gone through a whole process of dealing with my, my own breaking the world mm-hmm. and going like, I got, I got no place to stand here mm-hmm. in, in terms of, of judgment, but I'm surrounded by my own people who are experts at it. Mm-hmm. The Pharisees or, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they just don't know any better. How, how do we get out of that? We have to be confronted by something. And, and so I use the idea of, you know, choose one of your own children to go to hell, mm-hmm. you know, as, as a, okay, so this is, this is your sense of vengeance. You know, hell is a human, our concept of hell inside the traditional evangelical church is largely a man-made construction imagination of a justification for Mm self-righteousness and uh and it's non-relational it's a power it's a power fear-based thing yes even even though we have scripture that says there's no fear in love god is love you know Mm -hmm. and and it doesn't mean that god's not a fire because here's another piece is that i believe god is the furious fire but that that fire is for us not against us that's right the intention of the fire is to burn away everything that keeps us from being fully human and fully alive Mm -hmm. and so george mcdonald says you know if you if you trust the goodness of god you will run to god with your arms wide open and you will say please come and judge me to the core yes and and burn out of me everything that keeps me from being fully human and fully alive Mm -hmm. and um so I count on the judgment of God, but here's how here's how God defines judgment, vengeance. Yeah, in in Romans, it's like uh, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay, and then it says repay evil with good. 
Yes. So the definition of vengeance on the part of God is to repay evil with good. Yes. And it's like, what? What? You know? <laughs> and, and we don't realize that, that when we want to enact justice, judgment, in a retributive, punitive way, all we are doing is trying to find somebody to punish for our own sins. Yes. You know? Yes. And, and, and in order to be self-righteous, you have to deny your, your brokenness. Yes. And uh, and it's, and that's why Jesus in that scene with the woman, mm -hmm. he's he's going like, so if any if any of you have no sin, cast the first stone and starting with the oldest, they all leave. Right. You know, and I, I think that story, which is in John's gospel, I think the whole of John's gospel is a commentary on Genesis. And that scene is a is a picture of what happens with Adam and Eve in the garden mm -hmm. you know, where where, because she was fully deceived. Obviously, yes. she was she was deceived and set up by whoever the man was who wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? So they caught a woman and brought him. Oh, and, that's what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I just but, and just yeah. to throw in there, I always used to say, why were the Pharisees so upset when Mary Magdalene, you know, when G when Jesus was honoring Mary Magdalene? I said, well, because maybe some of them actually knew her and they didn't want her to open her mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But very, I was, yes. very possible. So yeah. again. Again, you know, it's like uh, in that scene, you have the eradication of self-righteousness through the exposure of everybody's false sense of superiority and, and willingness to judge, because that's what mm -hmm. they wanted him to do. They wanted Jesus to join us with our retributive, punitive judgment. And, and here is where there's a big demarcation. We have to make a decision whether we're going to believe Jesus or Moses, Interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because and, of the and, law. Mm -hmm. Yep, and a lot of us, a lot of us, fundamentalist evangelicals, we love Jesus, but we actually follow the way of Moses, mm -hmm. right? That's why we have a death penalty, because yep. we quote Moses. And Jesus constantly was saying, well, it's said, and he quotes Moses, and then he says, but I say to you this, and mm -hmm. he moves it into an, an entirely different reality. The way of Jesus is not the way of Moses. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so even on the Mount of Transfiguration, where the disciples are witnessing Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah, the voice of God is, look, this is my son, hear him. Hear him, that's As right. As in contrast to both Moses and the prophets. Right. So whatever we understand about Moses and the prophets, we have to read through the incarnation, the person of Jesus who comes to reveal to us the true character and nature of God, not the one that's been growing from, from all of history, which has right. been important too. But, you know, even then we're so blind, we don't recognize love when we see him. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's interesting because the law, I suppose, it, you know, it's, I've said to my husband, there's a stop sign for a reason. And sometimes we just don't comply. But it certainly doesn't reflect the higher intention of love and yeah. and yeah. and all those pieces that can go to go along with that. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about your thoughts on um, the Garden of Eden. And I just want to share this. In my trying to help understand and what I have in my limited way God taught me and through my conversations over the years, I always imagine God and Adam or Adam and Eve and, and God were, were together in fellowship. There was no division. Uh, they would hear him in the cool of the day or his voice. There was no differentiation. So when I teach women who are, you know, dealing with um, um, trust issues and all of that, one of the mm -hmm. things I say to them is, you know, Adam and Eve are in the garden and they hear a voice they've never heard before and they they don't recognize it but they respond to it and they believe it and suddenly relationship is broken okay let me tell the narrative a little bit different you tell me tell me so adam before she is even withdrawn from him right adam is in relationship with the father son and holy spirit there is no division there is no separation there is no sense of separation nothing you have a series of good, 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 very good, and very good in the description of the creation. Right. And then you have your first not good. Mm -hmm. And the question is, does anything that is not good originate in God? And the answer is no. Oh. So where does it originate? Well, we know from scripture that all brokenness originated in Adam. It didn't originate in the devil or Satan or any of, did not. You know, through one man, eight times in the New Testament, 
the brokenness of the cosmos entered through one man, Adam. And so that's why Jesus comes as the second Adam in order to, to right. re restore everything that the first Adam messed up, right? right. So where does, where does that relational sense of separation occur? It occurs in the first not good. It is not good that the man be in his separation is how the Hebrew puts it. Right. We think that, it, that it's just making a statement that, oh, God forgot to give him a woman or something, you know? And it's like, no, 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 no. This is Adam who has now turned his face away from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now we've got to find a way to draw him back to face to face, back, back to his humanity. So what do we do? So all the animals come and Adam can't find a face to face. He's already turned away from God's face, ah. right? And so then God gives him a woman to call him back to his humanity withdraws from him someone who is just as much made in the image and likeness of God as he is, mm -hmm. right? No distinction in terms of power, value, significance. And when it says, I've created a, sadly, the English says a helper. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is this is a help meet. And the word meet means face to face. Right. And the word help is used exclusively for women and God, right? Yes. That word, he is your present help in time of trouble. Right. So, so she is there to call him back to his humanity. And he takes power. He doesn't even name her Eve, right? He names her Isha, weak and fragile. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he takes authority. He's named all the animals, by, and so therefore taking authority. So he takes authority over the woman. And, um, and then he then draws the serpent from outside the garden, from where he was created. And in, in the Jewish tradition, the serpent represents all of creation outside the garden who has not experienced the express presence of the love of God, right? Because mm -hmm. e Eden is supposed to expand until it covers the cosmos. And um, so, so he brings the serpent in. Adam does. Because remember, Adam's not deceived. Adam's never deceived. Interesting. She twice in the New Testament says is thoroughly deceived. And so mm -hmm. how thoroughly is it when the man who she has turned to in terms of face-to-face -face sets her up to take the fall, right? Wow. So he brings a serpent in to make an accusation against God. And so, so when he is, because he's with her, so when he keeps his mouth shut, the serpent speaks the accusation. But when, when the serpent's silent, Adam speaks the accusation. So it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's more beautiful than that. Oh. They, heard, they heard the sound of Elohim Ru, um, Yahweh walking in the Ruach, yeah. which means in the spirit. Mm. Right? So all the Father, Son, and Spirit, Elohim Yahweh Ruach, right? And, um, and there's this then confrontation. And the confrontation is very kind on the part of God. It's not malicious. It's mm -hmm. not. It's not destructive, but it is first to Adam going like, what did you do? And Adam then makes the accusation against God, the woman you gave me. Yes. Right? So which is the same accusation as the serpent has been making. God is not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now you've got the collusion between Adam and the serpent now exposed mm. and the, the woman who is there to call him back to his humanity is now in a place where she has been thoroughly deceived. And what is God's response to her? Through you is going to come one that's going to save him save and crush the serpent's head, right? right. There's, yes. There's a completely... Redemption of her. Yeah, completely mm -hmm. different response. This is why she is called Eve, the mother of the living, because Adam knew on the day he ate of it, he would have already died. Oh. That's what the Hebrew says. And so this is also why Adam is escorted out of the garden. And she isn't. Interesting. And three times in Genesis chapter 3, it indicates specifically that he's the one that's escorted out. But all of our traditions and our art and everything else has, you know, Adam with his arm over Eve, their heads are down in shame, being escorted out with it. And there's a big flaming sword angel there. But the warning to her is... Your turning is going to be to the man, and he'll rule over you. So Adam's turning has already been away mm -hmm. from God before she is even there, mm -hmm. right? And now the warning is, is to her. Don't leave Eden. Don't turn, right? 
Right. So, so she's been given a promise to have a child who will crush the accusation and bring restoration. And so what does she do? At some point, she's thinking, how, how is this supposed to happen? How can a child come into being apart from the will or the flesh of a man? Mm -hmm. And so she follows him out. Right. And when she has her first child, who is Cain, she cries in the Hebrews, great. The English says, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, I've begotten a man child with the help of the Lord. But the Hebrew doesn't have with the help of. And New American Standard has it in italics, which means it's not in the Hebrew. Right. I have begotten a man child, the Lord. She thought she gave birth to uh -huh. the one who crushed the head of the serpent. And it turned out to be Cain. Because uh -huh. she tried to fulfill a promise within her own flesh like so many of us have done. That's the story of humanity. In there. <laughs> but here, here's, here's another piece to this that is so important. When the woman turns to the man, she, who is she turning from? Well, she's turning from face-to-face -face relationship with God. Mm -hmm. What is she turning to find? Only those things she can find in her relationship to God. What are those things? Identity, worth, value, yes. significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, community, and love. She thinks that she has to have a man in her life in order for those things to happen, mm -hmm. right? But he can't provide them because he's not God. Mm -hmm. Not in that sense. That's he right. cannot be the source of identity or worth or value or significance, yep. right? So she's saying, you need to give me these things. He's saying, I can't. And when you trap shame, you get fight or flight. Yes. He will rule over you. Yes. Right? And... Um, and so her turning is at least relational, which is much more like the, the nature of God. She's fundamentally healthier as a result. What, are, what is his turning? When he turns from God, where does he turn? He turns to the ground and the works of his hands. Mm. And the ground says, I can't provide you identity or the works of your hands. Can't provide you worth or value or significance, thorns and thistles. So now the man's using territory and property to try to find those things. Right. And the woman is looking to the man to find those things. And the call of the gospel throughout all of scripture is return, turn back, look at me. Yes. And when, and when Jesus comes, we are told that Jesus is the exact representation in the nature of God. You can see God face to face. Mm -hmm. You look at Jesus, it'll tell you not only who God is, it'll tell you what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you've got this, now you've got a war. So men, at some point, if they're going to come to health, they have to turn away from the property and territory that, and a sense of competition and comparison. And, you know, because men start wars. They yes. start, and, and when they turn to relationships, they normally, in their brokenness, use relationships as, as territory and property. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and women, they're... They've been in looking to men for the very things that God can give them, but men can't. Yes. And exactly. what, happen, what happens if everybody turns to face-to-face -to -face relationship with God? Mm -hmm. all, all of a sudden, you're not trying to suck the life out of somebody or out of your work or your career. Right. You know? And what's happened on a sociological scale is that when women who are relational, their skill set is better than so many men in particular occupations because of the necessity of relational uh, IQ, right? And so now men feel like their territory and property is being challenged. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, uh, they, there's this huge pushback against that. And then women, they're, they're kind of told they have to become like the brokenness of men in order to compete in the brokenness of, of looking for your identity out of your production and, and but they can't. I mean, fundamentally, they'll go back to relationship and they'll go back to to family, the culture of family of one sort or another. And it's because they're, they've got this relational integrity that has been there since the beginning. So I actually think that men have further to go than women. And, um, and I get that from the Genesis story. Mm -hmm. I love that. That is such a new way uh, for me to hear that framed. But it dovetails perfectly into what I believe I've understood from God himself, which is my relationship with him was look at me yeah, from so. the beginning. Look at me. There's yeah. nobody who's ever going to meet your needs but me. Yeah. And that set me free to be able to be objective 
In fact, I say to young girls all the time, I said, please remember, you're a child of God before you're a wife. You have no obligation or commitment to, yeah. to, to respond to things that are not of good and right. And if you love that person enough, you're going to call out that behavior. You yeah. don't sit there and comply and, and come up with this mindset. That's why I was in the pastor's office in trouble all the time, because I never bought that. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> you know, I, I can understand that. Yep. Oh, yeah. I remember at one point saying to my senior pastor, you know, really, um, are men really this weak that if they, you know, they've got to control everything? Like, are they so paranoid that they're going to lose their identity if their wife actually uses her God given brain? Like, what? what's the threat? Uh, and I, Com and then, competition of course, comparison. Yeah, and then I'd be in trouble again. But I didn't care. I was just labeled. I was labeled I'm, Jezebel. I'm so I'm so surprised. <laughs> I know it was Candace, it, Jezebel, Newton, Shiplet. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, but I was strong enough to to be able to look through that because of my revelation that God had presented Himself to me several times. That's fantastic. Yeah, without that, I probably would have. Uh, I wouldn't have survived. And so I just want to. I, I just love this conversation. I'd love to keep you here forever, but. Um, and just keep dialoguing with you. I'd like to be able to um, just address with you one of the things that really struck me when listening to your story about you and your wife yeah. and the challenges that you had in your relationship. Um, one of the things that I get concerned about with women, and I don't know anything about your situation, but I have women come to me, you know, they're, they're heartbroken. They found out their husbands have cheated on them. And yep. and it doesn't surprise me because humans are humans and you they don't have certain information or they don't have certain uh, value in their life. They're going to look to things. So to me, I get it. I really do understand it. I've said to my husband, who's a wonderful guy, I said, have you ever cheated on me? You're just stupid. Like, you're just stupid <laughs> because you're just hurting yourself. And it's. Yeah. I'm not going to be offended by it. I mean, I will be hurt because it changes the dynamics of trust between us. Absolutely. And that's a huge deal. Don't. It I mean, is a big deal. Don't don't downplay it. I mean, no, it is, I don't downplay it. It would it would be a really big deal. It's but I, yeah, I wouldn't let myself be a victim to that. I, evil. I get it. But you have the absolute right to be furious. Oh, of course you would, because you want to be angry at stuff that is damaging and hurtful and destructive, because that's the intention is to divert or, or to prevent any more destruction yep. and say it stops now. Yeah. And, and if he cheated on me, he'd have to go and find himself a nice little place to live. So for your, your for question well. for these women. My question you're... is, when, when I, I remember you sharing about how at some point you felt almost, I guess, I don't want to say the word, but maybe suicidal because you were so overwhelmed with how wrong you were feeling and how you were being questioned by uh, if, your wife, Kim, if I can say, like, how can someone do this? What is the balance? And maybe I'm wrong in this, but what is the balance between a woman having such a good sense of self that she doesn't become that judgment punitive, but still addressing the damage? Mm, great is there question. A balance? Uh, I think I she think she has every right to feel what she feels. Right. Everybody, she absolutely. Yeah, and I and I and and I think there's no formula to this, right? I can I can say from my side, and then I can put words in Kim's mouth to a point about this. Kim would say she didn't do it all right, but from my side, the intensity of her fury is part of what pushed me to deal with all the crap in my history ah. of my life. So I needed that fiery fury, regardless of, of whether she did it perfectly or not. Right, right. Right? So um, um, what, I, what really drives us nut, nuts, and Kim and I both agree about this, is, is women who take such a high road, they don't deal with their own grief and emotion and loss with regard to it. Uh -huh. they, don't, they don't get angry. Yeah. And therefore, they bury, right? They don't go down and deal with the stuff either. Right. Um, I needed to hit the bottom mm -hmm. and this and my adultery became the vehicle that was an invitation to hit the bottom, almost hitting the bottom. I would have killed myself, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. suicide is a way to run before you hit the bottom. Right. And, um, and, uh, and that's what started the 11 year of transformational process, which included therapy and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. But but the intensity of Kim's fury was absolutely essential for me. Um, and it, 
it was so constant for such a long period of time that that I I couldn't get away from it, and mm -hmm. that was and that was good mm -hmm. because it, it turns out that I'm actually really smart and creative, and I have this incredible capacity to bullshit my way through pretty much anything. I think we all do, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so I wanted I needed to get to the place where. I'm, I am a person of integrity and authenticity from deep inside, way deep inside mm -hmm. so that, so that I don't utilize those kinds of skills. And, and, and part of that was the fury. So, so yes, you can take your fury and it becomes your identity. That's not helpful, mm -hmm. not, not to the woman. So in a situation where a man has committed adultery, she can take that loss and for the rest of her life never move. That becomes her her new home. Yeah. But that's, that's true with anything that where we get stuck and there's no forgiveness. That's right. It doesn't have to be adultery. It can be any wound. Any yep, wound. yep. Because I know people who, who are still stuck in historical situations where they've not let go of a person's throat. So they've been carrying around this corpse the yeah. entire their entire life and poisoning every relationship that they're in. Yes. Now, ha having said that, let's make a real distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. Yes. You know, reconciliation is the rebuilding of trust. Forgiveness is where you let go their throat. Right. And and so you can forgive someone and never trust them again because they, you know, trust has got to be rebuilt. Yes. And that's miraculous when it happens. I'm mm -hmm. I'm like blown away when I see reconciliation happen, right? right? Because of the one, the perpetrator has to own own what they've done, and most of the time they don't. Right? You know, they oh they feel bad, but they don't it's own it. It's not the same, no. right? No, and if and if they just feel bad and they don't own it, the change is not real. They're mm -hmm. not, and so somebody has a right to go like, I'm sorry, I don't see the change over time, which is repentance, right? Mm -hmm. I don't see change over time. And unless you see change over time, you don't trust them. And right. that's totally legit. Right? And if you're truly sorry, you're not telling the person you wounded how, how to act, how to feel, and how to respond. Nope. Because it's it's no longer about what's going on with them. You're just truly, genuinely recognizing yeah. you're wrong, and you want to fix that. It kind of reminds me of the scripture when it says, when your ways are pleasing before God, he makes even your enemies to be at peace with you. I've always looked at that this way, that when I have when I have finally figured out what God is trying to say to me, yeah. the pressure comes off. Yeah. Yep. These people don't even realize half the time that that pressure, that heart, that push, push, push is it's something they can't even let go of, not because they're being bitter and ugly, but because something is compelling them to say he's not being authentic or she's not being authentic or something isn't real yet. And it's yeah, yeah. and it, it's not because you know the fruit, you know, the fruit of true yeah, yeah. repentance. So I didn't I didn't go to therapy in order to fix my marriage. I didn't go to therapy to fix Kim for sure. Right. You know, and uh, I went there to see if there was a way I could change. And uh, that's how desperate I was. And that's Which is why, awesome. Well, that's the is. place of that's the place. That's hitting the bottom. Yeah. Where you're you don't you're not pointing fingers at anybody. You're not trying to figure out who's at what percent to blame. Right. You know, you're saying there are some things in me, uh, you know, at that point I'm no longer in the seat of judgment. I'm like like that's the last thing that I'm going to do is to judge anybody because right. my my failure was so obvious and the damage that I'd done was so brutally clear mm -hmm. that it knocked me off that chair. Right. Thank thank God. Yes. Because that's the only time that I could actually begin to look at my stuff and say, is there a way to change? And that's why Scott, my therapist, was the first person in my life that I said, can you help me? Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm like... I either have to find a way to change or I'm done because I, I am not going to live in a world where I, I'm going to hurt people like this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just too much, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I'd have hurt one more person than I did, it would have been too much. Oh, I can't even imagine because when you wake up and you actually see what you've done, it's too much to bear. Yeah. And I wrote a little saying, I love you way too much to let you hurt yourself by hurting me. I'm going to make that stop like now. We're yeah. not going to go there. Because, That's boundaries, yep. Yeah, the damage to you, the damage to me is is too profound. Yeah. Uh, do you and um, Kim ever talk as couples together or do oh. um, seminars together? Rarely. Um, 
we have very different personality types okay. and, I, and I'm really, I like uh, the interaction, the public right. interaction. My favorite right. time of when I speak is Q and R questions and responses, yeah. which is all fluid. Yeah. Um, and Kim's not an upfront person. Right. Um, she, she's more a one-on-one -on -one person. We've done a couple uh, question and response times together, but she will, she'll look right at me, you know, and, and it's, it's, and it's not that she's a very strong person and she's right. got very strong opinions and all of that, mm -hmm. but it's just not her frame of reference or environment that she does. And right. uh, so, yeah. That, that's cool. So where, so, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, none of us know when we uh, respond to that, that uh, um, impressions inside of us to either write a poem, write a book, write a story, do whatever it is that you're doing. And I understand the story behind writing that book and, you know, not having the funds and, and just being unique enough to put that book down for your children. Uh, obviously, none of us ever know what happens with this vast when God breathes on something and his intention. So two questions just in closing. One, what is Paul Young up to today? Okay. And number two, what would be so soul satisfying for you to know that your life has had an impact so that you could close your eyes and say, that's all I've ever that's enough for me to see that I have left this. Hmm. So I, I get a phone call from my son at the time. He's at, he's in school for engineering at Oregon State. And he is 21 at the time. And he calls me sobbing on the phone. And he says, Dad, this morning I just read chapter 15, which is Festival of Friends. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the only chapter in the book never touched by a rewrite. It's in the book the way I wrote it the day I wrote oh. it. And um, and there's a scene in it where he's standing on a hill with the Holy Spirit, Mackenzie, the main character, and um, and they're watching Jesus walk into a community of worship and people and at a distance, and um, and that's that's really autobiographical in the sense that I always felt like I'd barely snuck in, you know, and hoping hope, hoping nobody would see that I was there and ask me why I was there, you know, <laughs> and uh, but I was watching God do stuff with those people over there, and. Um, and, uh, and then in that scene, Jesus turns to Mackenzie and McKen they catch eyes and Mackenzie hears him say, in the middle of all of that community, he, he hears Mackenzie say, hey, McKen hey, Mac, I'm especially fond of you. Mm -hmm. And my son is bawling and he says, oh. dad, I heard him say that to me. Oh. See, that's enough right there. It is enough. That was, that was, you know, because I wrote the the book for my kids, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, that was enough. I mean, it's the other, the other part of the answer to your question is, is a mantra that I have that my only spiritual discipline, and that is learning how to just live inside the grace of one day. Yes. Right. That is, that is how I live. I'm working on projects and stuff and I have a calendar, but I could be dead by tomorrow. I mean, who knows? For real. But that's the point. Like you said, you, you just don't know what anything means. Right. So why don't, why don't, instead of trying to figure it out in advance, why don't we let it unfold and learn how to stay inside the grace of one day? Why don't we learn to be like children and who trust, who say, yeah, let's do that again, you know, or <laughs> let's, let's, you know, this is fun and, um, and be present rather than trying to be in some imagination that doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, like I said, I've got the projects and I've got lots going on, um, a lot on my plate, a lot of travel, a lot of talking and things like that. But we all know that one phone call and everything comes to a grinding halt. It's true. And, um, so that's not where I want to live. I live inside today's grace. I mean, my whole life has led up to this conversation. So why would I want to be anywhere else? You know, exactly. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for all your time. I really, really appreciate chatting with you. Very, and, very welcome. Um, it's been an I'm, honor and very fun. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. I hope to stay in touch and absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. God bless. Bless you. Okay. Bye bye. bye.